I don't think we'll have time to start chapter 8. We just need to get through 7 thoroughly. So let's pick up where we left off. Don't have too much left here. Our reader is? Okay, uh, it's the second paragraph on page 177. Mm-hmm. Learning to make a trill involves placing the tongue very loosely. You're still going down a lot. You've got a habit of going down. Listen, just listen for a minute. Learning to make a trill involves, instead of going involves, this is, this is what you're doing. You're going, learning to make a trill involves placing the tongue. This is what you do. But what we want you to do is to always kind of lilt back up. So it's learning to make a trill involves either stay flat or go up involves involves instead of involves so learning to make a trill involves placing the tongue very loosely in exactly the right position so that it will be set in vibration by a current of air learning to make a trill involves placing the tongue placing the tongue if you go too high on placing what can't we do we don't have enough room for the tonic stress on tongue. So don't go too high. You have to go high, but not too high. Placing, play, play. This is where it is in my range. You all have different ranges. But you can hear what anybody's range is if they just say a few words. So learning to make a trill, that's a tonic, will be, uh, involves placing the tongue, involves placing, can you tell? It's somewhere in my mid-range, a little higher. You know it's not here, and it's not here. It's somewhere in the middle. So you need to kind of stay in the middle or a little higher because you need to mark stresses. But if it's not the tonic stress, don't go too high. Try one more time. <coughs> Learning to make a trill involves placing the tongue. Placing, go down a little. Placing, placing, placing the tongue. There you go, yeah. Very loosely. In exactly the very is too low. You didn't stress it at all. You need stress, but it's a non-tonic. Very loosely. Very loosely. There we go. Yeah. In exactly the mm, right. Not too much. In exactly the right position, so that it will be set in vibration by a current of air. Okay, you're getting it. You need to do. You need to do ten minute a day pra uh, practice. Find a, a model that you like. You can use British English. British is fine because they do almost all the same things in intonation that we do. Um, but you're, you need to get control of the place and the range for stresses, for non-tonic stresses and then tonics. So in exactly the right position. So kind of watch my hands. I'm going to show sort of where they are. Very loosely in exactly the right position in exactly the right position, okay? In exactly the right position. Okay. Good, except S is Z. Pos position. Right. So that it will be set in vibration. So that it will be set. You're still going down without thinking it because it's a habit. So that it will be set in vibration. So that it will, it, so that it will be set in vibration. Good. By a current of air. There you go, good. The easiest position position right. seems to be with the tongue, with the tongue just with, behind. Well, the first time was okay with the tongue. With the tongue mm -hmm. just behind the upper front teeth, and very lightly touching the alveolar ridge. The alveolar. Don't go down. The alveolar ridge. Alveolar ridge. Yeah. If you get if you get the tongue in just the right position and relaxed, you can blow across the top of it, setting setting. Uh, setting, setting it, don't go down. Setting. Setting it vibrate, setting it vibrating in a voiceless trill. Mm -hmm. Many people find it easier to start with a voiceless trill, and then add voicing once once they can make steady vibrate vibrations. Good, that was good. The jaw should be fairly closed, leaving a space of five millimeters. Leaving a space of five millimeters. 
leaving a space of five millimeter. Mm -mm. Millimeters. Millimeters. Right. Between the between the front teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay, slow down. You're now doing very well. You got the intonation pretty good here. Um, you need to slow down because especially with single syllable stressed words, we need a pause after them to keep the rhythm right. So we don't say five millimeters between the front teeth. It's five millimeters between the front paws teeth. Okay? Five millimeters between the front between the front teeth. Mm -hmm. Check this by inserting the top of a pencil. Ins inserting. Inserting. No, it's not Z, it's S. Uh, inserting. Mm -hmm. Check check this by inserting the top of a the top of a pencil between your teeth and then removing it before making the sound. Mm -hmm. The problem experienced by most people... It was pretty good, but um, you can improve it. The problem... Just remember... That's usually what we do all day long. Stress, da-da-da, stress, da-da-da, tonic stress. We do that the whole day long when we're speaking English. So, the problem experienced by most people, remember that people is very shu, so we usually don't stress it, okay? The problem experienced by most people who fail to make trills is that the blade of the tongue is too stiff. Um, remember we said last time, we're going to try to make it a goal for you all to learn the alveolar trill. Did you start on it or did you forget about it? <laughs> Please put it in your notes in big letters. I want you all to try to learn the alveolar trill. Now you may not be able to learn it exactly when you want to learn it, but if you keep practicing, you will learn it. So all of you, please, if you don't already know it, if you, don't already, if you do already know it, then no problem. So if you don't know how to make the alveolar trill yet, the rrrr, put it in your notes, practice, and you'll get a few suggestions here. And remember, there's a web page plus the BBS post, all of that will help you. There's a long linguist post that has even more ideas. If those ideas don't work, you can keep on trying. Sometimes one buried in there is exactly what you need. But let's just go over what Jerome just read. To make a trill, you place the tongue loosely right where it can make, uh, be put into vibration by a current of air. So that means if we're blowing air from the lungs and the tongue is in the right place, your tongue doesn't have to do anything. It'll just flutter in the breeze. You know, like if you have a strip of paper and the wind is blowing, it'll go like this. And that's what we want our tongue to do, like a strip of paper in the wind. It'll just be very limp and relaxed, and the air will make it hit and then come back, hit and then come back. The easiest position seems to be with the tongue just behind the upper front teeth. So just right behind, if you get the tongue in just the right position and relaxed, you can blow across the top of it. So the tongue is relaxed there, and you just blow air. You have to, it's not totally, totally relaxed. You kind of have to, because if I just leave it sitting there, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> you do have to move it somewhat with some muscle, muscle work there. So you have to push it up a little bit. If you're just getting, that means you have to push your tongue up a little bit. Sounds like a cat purring, doesn't it? And then you can add voicing. And by the way, every year this comes up sometime or other, you don't seem to have a verb in Chinese for purr, P-U-R-R, -R, purr. You know that? We've talked about it before in class. Well, at least it's a verb. That's a word. We can use that. <laughs> you do it really well. <laughs> do you have a cat? No. Oh, goodness. You're good at imitating. That's great. All right, so hulu sheng, or what is the verb used? So, or do you have any verb with it? Fa tu hulu sheng. Yeah. Okay, is that how you say it? Is it just holy or is it something you've actually heard? It's holy, I can understand it too, but I never heard it before. 
The rest of you have actually heard it before. That's what I mean. It's just hoodie, not necessarily something you've heard, but it works fine. That's the first time I've heard somebody come up with something plausible for purring. Because every year they say, no, no, we don't have a word for that. <laughs> okay. Mm, it sounded kind of like purring. That's what brought that up. <clears throat> so you have your tongue in the right position. It can't be totally limp. If you make it totally limp, like I said, you'll just blow air across. Um, but if it's in just the right position, then you can set it into free vibration. <sighs> The jaw should be fairly closed. That means the tongue has to be pushed up a bit. Closing the jaw helps that. And there's a space of about five millimeters between the front teeth. That's hard to imagine, five millimeters. But you will feel it when it's right. Check this by inserting the top of a pencil between your teeth, then moving it before making the sound. So you can stick a pencil to keep your teeth apart. He says that's about five millimeters. but. Some, it seems like more than five millimeters to me. Anyway, your teeth are open just a little bit. And then <clears throat> take it out before you try to make the sound. <laughs> the problem most people have is that their tongue is too stiff. Because if you're nervous and your tongue is stiff, it can't be set into free vibration. It'll just sit there stiff. That's true of everything we do. If we're stiff, we can't do anything well. Usually, except for lift weights. I guess we have to be stiff for that. Okay, so that's how to make a trill. That's all clear. Let's go on. Most people can learn to produce a voice tap by adopting, adopting the typical American English pronunciation. American English pronunciation. American English pronunciation of words such as Betty, which can be transcribed as Betty. Right, Betty, Betty. And, mm, what was it I noticed? Produce. We don't say produce. We say produce. Everybody remember alveolars plus U? In American is usually just alveolar plus U. Produce. 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 <laughs> Sounds like my friend. Okay. How? Produce. You should also be, at, be able to produce, produce a retroflex flap. Flex. Flex. Yep, you did everything else fine. You corrected some things very well. So you should also be able to produce a retroflex flap. Remember what that is? Arda, 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 arda. Mm -hmm. Okay. As we have seen, many speakers of American English. American, your N. American English. Try to link it. American English. There we go. English. There we go. Use this type of articulation. Use this type of articulation because this is mentioned, this has been mentioned, so we don't stress it so much. Use this type of articulation in. Use this type of articulation in. Articulation in. Articulation in. Right. Sequences such as herding, in which the tongue is curled up and back after the R colored vowel. R colored vowel. R colored vowel, right, and then strikes the back part of the alveolar ridge. Mm -mm. Alveolar ridge. Mm. Ridge. Ridge. Uh huh. As it moves down during the consonant. Right. So that's just an example where you might find it in the speech of some Americans, hurting. Use a retroflex for the R. Hurting. 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 That produces a kind of retroflex flap. All clear? Next. <coughs> when you have mastered all these sounds, try saying them in different contexts. Contexts. Con contexts. Hmm? Contexts. Contexts. You have a little extra sound. Contexts. Contexts. There we go. You might also learn to say voiced and voiceless trills, taps, and flaps. Try varying the place of articulation producing both dental and alve post-alveolar trills and flaps. Some languages, such as Malayalam and Toda, spoken in southern India. Southern. Everybody watch that one. Okay? South, but southern. South, the noun in the south. Southern. Right. Spoken in southern India, contrasts alveolar and dental trills. The word for room in Malayalam is ara. Okay, that's got a trill. Can you trill? Arra. Okay. Whereas the word for half is arra. 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 
Ar ter ter. You have to touch your teeth. Arra. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, for us because it's not natural. So arra and arra. 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 Okay, it's not that deep, but in theory, that's a dental drill. Arra. Mm -hmm. The total rhotics on a CD illustrate an even more complex situation in which three kinds of trills are contrasted. Are contrasted. But many native speakers would say contrasted. Um, I think I'll try to look for it during the break. Let me just write a note to myself. Okay. So we can have some kinds of what for us would be very difficult contrasts. Uh, try saying them in different contexts. That means with different vowels or consonants around them. And you might also learn to say voiced and voiceless trills. So a voice trill is but you can make it voiceless. And taps, ara, ara, and ara, ara. I, I, I make the, vo the vowels voiceless as well. Arha. It's really hard to do without devoicing the, va the vowels. And flaps. Okay, so ara, ara, ara. Okay? Mm. Vary the place of articulation. A dental trill and a post alveolar trill. We just did that. Okay. Um, well, we did dental and alveolar, but you can also have a post alveolar trill. Your tongue is further back, so a normal trill is rrr, rrr, and further back would be rrr, rrr, rrr. Just pull your tongue in further back. She's a mind, Senda. It's almost palatal. Rrr, rrr, is dental. Rrr, is alveolar. Rrr, is post alveolar. Rrr, is palatal. Okay? So you can but to me they sound so similar. If I had to learn how to contrast them, I bet we could all learn it. But since we haven't, they all sound the same, pretty much. You can hear a different resonance depending on how deeply within your oral cavity your tongue is. But unless you're trained in it, it's going to be kind of hard. All right, let's go on. <coughs> the tongue tip is not the only articulator. Mm -hmm. The only... Mm -hmm. uh... Remember to read ahead and figure out what needs to be focused on. The only articulator. Right. Why? Why? <coughs> it's a kind of contrast, but you need to watch out for certain words that should tip you off. For example, remember some people, others, the only one that ever, because it's very jiedui, right? As soon as you see something that's very strong and jiedui, it probably needs stress. The tongue tip is not the only articulator that can be trilled. Can you say the word after only again? Mm, articulator. Articulator? Articulator. Yeah. Articulator. I don't hear the U in there. Articulator. Now it sounds right. Okay. okay, were you putting a U in there or not? You were, okay. It sounded like it was halfway there, but it wasn't clear. Articulator. Make the Q really clear. Remember, this is not alveolar. K is not alveolar, so it definitely has a U. Everyone, articulator. Articulator. There we go. Uh, the tongue tip is not the only not articulator. The, not uh, the. It sounds like not the. Not, not the. the, yeah. Not the mm -hmm. only articulator that can be trailed. Uvula trails occur in some dialects in. of French. In some, in mm -hmm. some like, <laughs> dialects. In some dialects. Dialects is also new here. So in some dialects of French. In some dialects of French. Mm -mm. Some can't be higher than dialects. Why? I just mentioned why. It's, some gives contrast, but that way we would make it even stronger than dialects. But why do we not say some dialects, but we have to say in some dialects because dialects wasn't mentioned yet, right? So dialects hasn't been mentioned before. It, that is new information too. So we don't say some dialects. We say some dialects both get stressed because dialects is new. Uvula, uvular trills occur in some dialects. Uvular trills. It's not a compound. Uvular trills right. occur, occur in, some, <coughs> in some dialects. Slow French. down. Remember what I just told Jerome? When you have single syllables with stress, what do you have to do? Slow down, Aliva. 
pause. So listen to my timing carefully. Don't, don't be thinking of how you're gonna imitate it. Keep your brain completely clear so the sound can go in. I had another pronunciation workshop yesterday. This one was in Taipei. And I have to say, there is a difference. I mean, Zhongnanbu, they were very good. They were very Xin. But Taipei, there were a lot of people who are already at quite a high level, like people who sometimes ask very technical phonetics questions on Karen and Ivy. If you're not on Karen and Ivy, please add it. I've mentioned it before. Please add it because there's so many good questions. And you will learn a lot, and we can save a lot of time in class. It's Karen on Ivy League Analytical English. This isn't for Guangzhou. I do this as an eagle, all right? I, do, I don't get any money for this. Neither does Ivy. There are now about 3,700 people on there. 3,700. And I post the links for Ivy and also fun phonetics links or things having to do with English. <coughs> I don't post as much on NTU Phonetics on Facebook. I post a lot here. So there are a lot of fun language links that you will see here. There was a very funny one, which is a bit vulgar, actually. Anybody see that on my Facebook? Sophie has seen it, maybe. They, it's, it's an ad for Kmart. Kmart is just a damai tang. And they say, um, they ship pants. They ship pants. They ship pants. 听得懂吗? Ship is... 运,对,对,对,它会运。很多东西现在是有够的,对不对?就是要运给你了。They like, ship pants. That's what it is. There's nothing wrong with it. But what does it sound like? Yeah, it sounds like S-H-I-T. And they did a whole commercial about it. Everybody's saying, you know, they ship 90s, you know. <laughs> 90s, and they get shape how. They did the whole commercial like that, and that's quite vulgar. But they get by with it. They're not allowed to say words like that on television in America. You can say them in movies, you can, and say them, and you hear them a lot in movies, right? All kinds of four little words, do they? Yeah. But you're not allowed to say them on national television in the US. And so, they're saying things like, they ship pants. And it sounds very, very vulgar and obscene, but not obscene. That's not really obscenity. It's just vulgar. But they did a whole commercial like that because actually it's very innocent. They didn't really say the word. It just sounds like it. <laughs> it just sounds like it. And that's why it's so funny. When you watch it, you laugh, even though it's so vulgar. And somebody made a comment. They said, Kmart dares do this because they're not Target and they're not these other fancy stores. They're Kmart and Tingjia. So the link is on Karen on Ivy. Please like it on Facebook and then follow some of the stuff. There's some interesting things, a lot to do with Facebook. And recently, some people have been asking technical phonetics questions. For example, what is the difference between an allophone and a phone? We haven't really discussed that in detail in this class, I'm afraid. And I gave him a long, detailed answer. And he said, yeah, but can there be a phone that is not an allophone? So it's like a yeah, you'll find that on Karen and Ivy. So I'm just saying that, so please, um, please take advantage of it because it's there. That's, that's really what I'm trying to do and get people sort of thinking about these things. Okay, so um, what were we talking about now? Let's get back to where we were. Um, Oh, I was talking about the, the fine like a gongzuo fang yesterday. Yeah, so a lot of people showed up. That was that was kind of interesting. But something that was the same for all three of them is they were very, very lucing. They were very, very and lucing about learning. Yesterday, a lot of people came up and they shook my hand. And they got all excited. She, they said, I never learned this stuff before. They don't teach this in Taiwan. And one lady kept hugging me. <laughs> OK, now I'm just saying that to show that you are taking it for granted because you get it twice a week. No big deal. It's a lot of work, <laughs> right? Right? 
but other people have not gotten it. Maybe when you first started hearing it, you were a little surprised and you think, gee, they didn't teach us that stuff before. But now you're so used to it. <laughs> it's just more work. Um, but for them, it was all fresh yesterday. And they were honestly, sincerely excited. I don't think they were just being nice Taiwanese. Okay, They were just thinking, wow, I learned so much. This is new stuff. So in a way, you, know, you really have a duty out there to help other people get this information out. It's not out there yet. You, know, you need the help. Um, let's see. We were talking about, oh, uvular trills occur in some dialects of French. Some dialects of French, they're all important because all of it is new, and they all need, stress, uh, need to be stressed. So try it again. Um, uvular trills occur, occur in some dialects mm -mm -mm. of... So that's what I was saying. You're going too fast, and Jerome was doing the same thing too. You have to slow down. When there is a word that is important, we give it stress. And if it has only one syllable, we have to make it zhuang zhong and stick out by leaving a pause after it. We can't just slip, let it slip by because we will, the other person will never catch its importance if we do that. So listen carefully and kind of keep this audio file in your head. Uvular trills occur in some dialects of French. Now listen a few more times. Let that sink in. Record that file and keep it in your brain. Uvular trills, pause, end of subject, occur in some, pause, big pause, because some is important, one syllable. In some dialects of French, in some dialects of French, everybody got the rhythm? Why don't we try it? Listen again and then repeat. Uvular trills occur in some dialects of French, go. Uvular trills occur in some dialects of French. Not some dialects. We're not doing that because we haven't mentioned dialects. If we haven't mentioned it before, it needs stress. Because the minute we take the stress off, it's taking your listener's attention away from the word, which means they'll probably miss it. We can do that with words that are simply function words. If they're just telling us about in, on, under, the, to, doesn't matter. They will catch that. Those can be reduced, and they're certainly not stressed. Like, I'm going to the theater. I'm going to the, to the, to the, doesn't matter. As long as they are there to form the structure that holds the sentence together, that's enough. We don't need them stressed, because we don't need to think about their meaning, because they're not so solid. They're very shoe. But for anything that has some kind of a solid meaning or contrastive meaning, slow down. Stress it. Slow down. One syllable, leave a pause. If it has more than one syllable, you can make it about as long, but you spread your time across a number of syllables. For, for example, instead of saying some, if we said numerous, numerous has how many syllables? Three. So listen to these two, compare the two. <clears throat> Uvular trills occur in some dialects of French. Okay? Compare to. Uvular trills occur in numerous dialects of French. Some dialects of French, numerous dialects of French. Do you understand my point here? What's my point, Vivian? Um, <clears throat> Pause if, if it's going on soon. with stress, because we don't have any kind of Huan Chong to Xi Shou the rest of the time. We need to give that stressed word. But if we have more than one syllable, you can fill the pause with the unstressed syllables, right? So. In some dialects of French, in numerous dialects of French, right? They have about the same rhythm. But because some doesn't have any more syllables to spread it out, spread out your speaking on, your, your rhythm on, the time that you're allotting it on, you have to pause. Let's try it one more time and concentrate. Don't rush. Uvular trills occur. Even that is too fast. Slow down. Uvular trills mm -hmm. occur. And we need, to, we need a continuation rise there because it's the end of the subject. So uvular trills, uvular trills, pause, try it. Uvular trills occur in some dialects of French. You did it, okay. French. 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 Good. French. Although, as we have noted already, already, most, already most forms of French have a Most forms of French, dun, dun, da, dun, 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 da, dun, 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 dun. Most forms of French 
have a uvular fricative in words. Now, what is contrastive here? Fricative. Right. And most forms of French have a uvular fricative. Right. Don't go too high on uvular. It needs stress. A uvular mm -hmm. fricative. A uvular fricative uh -huh. in words such as rose. Good. The symbol for a uvular trail is a small capital R. Right, it's a capital R. Capital yeah. R. Mm -hmm. There is no symbol to distinguish between, uv uh, between uvular fricatives and approximates. Fricatives, don't go down too low because we're comparing. Um, there is no symbol to distinguish between uvular fricatives and approximates because this phonetic difference. Because this? Because this phonetic difference mm -hmm. is not used. Slow down. Not is a shi ci. It's an honorary shi ci, not. Because its meaning is so powerful, it changes something to just the opposite of what it was. So, although it looks like a function word, it is actually an honorary content word, okay? Um, because this, uh, this phonetic difference is not used to distinguish words in any language. Good. Both sounds are symbolized by an upside down capital R. Pointing to the right, okay? So those are two symbols. You must learn them for the test. And you have to pay special attention. Like I said, it's very easy for me to reverse the way that the R is, is written. And my students will point it out when I do that, which I am very appreciative of, but I'll try to remember it right. So a capital R is a trill. An upside down R pointing to the right is what? A uvular? Fricative or approximate. They don't have a separate symbol for those two because they're never contrasted as far as we know in any language. So are we okay on this? We've already talked about a uvular fricative and a uvular trill. So a uvular trill, capital R, it's the gargling sound that we tried last time. Make it more xiang liang. There we go. That was a good one. Okay, good. Okay, if you need help, go to Jerome. He's got it, okay? <laughs> All right, and then we have the upside down capital R. What was it? Oh, okay. Upside down capital R pointing right. Or it can be either touching or not touching. If it's really close, it's a fricative. If there's no friction, then we hear a, an approximate. So we're okay on these two symbols and sounds? Well, two symbols and three sounds. Let's go on. Trios involving the lips occur in a few languages. The IPA symbol for these sounds is a small capital B. Small capital B? <coughs> it's a small capital B just as a small capital R is used for a uvular trio. Right, R kagangawiyan, that's a tonic, a small capital R. A small capital R there we go. is used for a uvular trio. Good. In Kele and Titan, mm -hmm. two languages spoken in Pap Papua New Papua. Gin Papua, mm -hmm. New Guinea. New Guinea. Everybody learn that. That's a very important country. It's a very complex country. It's got a bunch of islands and part of it is in Indonesia. It's basically attached to Indonesia. There's a part of Indonesia called Irian Jaya and it belongs to Indonesia but actually they speak Papuan and Austronesian languages there. I think mainly Papuan. So actually part of their culture is in Indonesia, belongs to Indonesia. Then the rest of it is Papua New Guinea and they speak something like, do you know how many different languages in Papua New Guinea? Want to guess? Over a hundred is true. How much more than a hundred? Okay, then it's now just 100, 150, 175. Uh, give me 200. I have 200. <laughs> it's about 800. 800. About 800. It's one of the most linguistically rich parts of the entire world. It's Papua New Guinea. All concentrated in that one area. And there are two main language families spoken in Papua New Guinea. And I just mentioned them. Did you catch them? Right, that's the second one. 
The first one is Papuan. We just call it Papuan, and it includes many languages, some of which may not be related. I don't know if they're all related or not. They are very diverse, I can tell you that. But we just call all of those languages that are not Austronesian Papuan. And there's a guy named Foley who researches them. You can read his book on Papuan languages. And many other languages were brought from, originally from Taiwan, you know, through the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, all those places. Some ended up in Papua New Guinea. Those are Austronesian languages. Okay, for example, um, um, the national language of Papua New Guinea is called Motu, M-O-T-U, and they, I think they often call it Police Motu. Um, that one is an Austronesian language, as I remember. You can check me to make sure that I've remembered right, but their national language is an Austronesian language. And they also speak Pidgin. And a Pidgin is, we talked about Yang Jing Bang before, maybe. Yang, Yang Ren de Yang. Jing is a Yan Shui, a Jing. Bang is a Sandy and Shui, a Bing. 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 And it's pronounced Bang. Yang Jing Bang. Yang Jing Bang. And that's Pigeon. And a Pigeon is a contact language. It's a language that we talked about it before with China, remember? With the Zhu Jie. And the Brits came in and colonized the area, and they needed a lot of local Chinese to do a lot of Zhu Gong. And they needed to communicate with them, and the Brits certainly weren't going to learn Chinese. So the locals had to learn some kind of simple English. And that was a Pigeon. That's a Yang Jing Bang. That's a Yang Jing Bang. That's a Pigeon. That's the first generation. They learn it. It's very simplified. It is not a complete language. It's very telegraphic sometimes. It does not have a complete grammar. But very often, the children of people who speak pidgins, especially if you speak different pidgins or they speak different home languages, the children speak a common language based on a pidgin. That's called a creole. You should have had that in your guide. If you haven't, do a little reading on pidgins and creoles. We're not going to talk about it much in this class. P is not closed here. Pidgin and creole. So Creole is a second gen generation contact language, a common language often used by slaves. For example, the ones growing sugarcane in Hawaii. And they needed to communicate with each other. They came from different parts of, say, Africa or the world or wherever it was. Not so much Africa there, but different parts of the world. They had different home languages, and they spoke a language in common, and that was a Creole. That becomes a very Wanzhande Yuyan. It sounds maybe a bit like English with a different grammar, and it sounds kind of yuan shi, but in fact, it's a very complete language. You need to know that. Do some reading up on it. It's in the Ugai Kopen. Pigeons and Creoles. So they, they, speak, they speak a pigeon in Papua New Guinea. It's called Tok Pisin. Pigeon becomes Pisin. And Tok is Tok, yeah. So Tok, tok Pisin, that's the name of their their other national language, because they speak so many different languages, and not everybody speaks Motu. But most people learn Tokpising, and that's their Gongtong Yu, that's their lingua franca. Okay? As I remember it, the details may have changed or may be slightly different, but that's mainly how it goes. And Papua New Guinea, we need to know how to say the country's name. So, everyone, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. Papua New, I say New. Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. And it's not Guinea, it's Guinea, Guinea. And there's also a country in Africa called Guinea. So you should be, you should know how to say that. Papua New Guinea. Mm. Two languages spoken in Papua New Guinea by labial trios occur in a large number of words. The Tetan for red is mbule. <laughs> Pretty good. Bule. 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 We already did that. Oof, I did it. <laughs> uh, to pronounce the first part of this word, you need to hold the lips loosely together while making M, and then blow the lips apart. While making M. Mm. While yeah. making M. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then blow the lips apart. Some people find it easier to trio the lips than the tongue tip. What did you stress here? Um, 
You had everything right except one word. Some people find it easier to trill the lips than the tongue tip. Then we get the point. You see, if we don't stress it, it slips by. We don't get the point. It's just like in Chinese. If you don't put the important information at the end, you don't get the point of what somebody's saying. And I made that mistake in a translation once. I put the information in the sentence, but it was not at the end, and people didn't get what the point was. It'd take a while to remember what the sentence was, but it's not hard to find examples. So in English, we don't put it at the end. We give it a lot of stress, and that way we know what's important. Okay. Mm, some people find it easier to trill the lips than the tongue tip. There we go. Good. If we, uh, if you are having difficulty, mm, having in Zongyama. If you are having difficulty, there we go. Making an alveolar trill. See if you can get the sensation of making a trill by making a bilabial. Trill pause by sequence two, right? See if you can get the sensation of making a trill by making a, a by making a bilabial trill. No. <laughs> 小朋友都会啊。Yeah. Uh, Kelly and Titan bilabial trills are included on the CD. All right. Um, in Australia, they have a very unusual musical instrument called the didgeridoo. Have you ever heard of that? It's just a long guanzi. That's all it is, really. And usually, traditionally, it was a log hollowed out by ants. The ants would eat out the inside of it and make it their home. And that's how you play the didgeridoo. And actually, that's how you play a lot of instruments in general. <coughs> you just do a bilabial trill into the instrument, and then it makes a very weird noise, which you won't want to listen to too long. Usually, in most cases, we might listen to a didgeridoo later in this course in chapter eight. Okay. Mm. So, let's try to make a bilabial trill. Start it off with an m、mm、sound. We tried it last time. Let's try it again. I don't get it every time. There we go. Your lips need to be a bit loose. Okay, relaxed. That's it. So that's a special kind of trill, not common. The only place I've read about it existing in a language is in Papua New Guinea. Okay, let's go on. Peter Ladefoget also reported hearing a labial labial dental flap. A labial dental flap. A labial dental flap. In Margi, of I would say Margi. Margi.、Mm -hmm. In Margi of northern Nigeria. Niger. Nigeria.、Mm -hmm. In which the lower lip is drawn back inside the upper teeth. And then allowed to strike against them, them,、mm -hmm. in passing back to its normal position. There is no IPA symbol for this sound. There's no IPA symbol for this sound. There's no IPA symbol for this sound. You got down. There is no IPA symbol for this sound. There is no IPA symbol for this sound.、Mm -hmm. We included this sound in Table 7.6 to demonstrate how to symbolize a sound for which there is no IPA symbol. IPA symbol. IPA symbol. Good. In all such cases. In all. In all.、Mm? In, in all. In all、right. such cases. Cases.、Uh, in all such cases. Good. It is possible to use an asterisk. And define it. And define it. And define it, as we have done in the table. All right, we practiced that last time because we went through Table 7.6. So a lot of this actually is, in part, review. So look at page 177, the asterisk, the last item in Table 7.6, voiced labiodental flap, in, what? Bebu, 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 bebu. Boo, boo. Okay, so it's flapping. It's not boo, boo. It's boo, boo. It flaps out. So it's a special sound. We don't have a special symbol for. So we just use an asterisk and define it. Any questions? Are we okay? Now we've got a bunch of sounds that are quite important, and they're going to be in the probably the next dictation we have. So pay attention. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Our 
Yeah, we talked about it last time. In theory, it's a uvular trill, but it's usually realized as a uvular fricative or uvular approximant, or it's gone altogether after a vowel. So it can, it has, there's a lot of variation. Basically, it is uvular. If you want to say it in isolation really clearly, it will be a trill. And if you want to really emphasize something you're saying, it's like richtig, richtig. That's when you're showing off and acting really authoritative, okay? But usually, minimum quad song, usually it's just a fricative or an approximate. Richtig, richtig, richtig. Then it, that's an approximate. Can you hear? Richtig, richtig. Sometimes it's fricative, usually it's an approximate. Richtig, 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 richtig. But after a vowel, it's often gone completely, just like in British English, ka, and in German, kalte, kalte. Sometimes, if you want to say kalte, that's very emphatic. Karte, karte. Sometimes it's, it's usually an approximate or it's just gone. Er, ta, er. Yeah, okay. Did I answer the question? Yep, okay. Well, I guess since we're starting on a new section, who's our next reader? Okay, so be ready. Second hour. Let's continue. We have a new section, but there's a story that I didn't tell that I told another class that I think is worth telling. And we're often talking about stress due to contrast. And I gave you the example in Chinese before of Remember? All right. Now that's when there is intensification. But in other situations, we de-stress and we have contrasted stress in English when you don't do it in Chinese. When you're simply repeating information that is not intensified. And I found a good example when I was listening to Faye Dia on the way to school one day, on the way to the campus one day. And they were talking with an author who has one Japanese parent and one Taiwanese parent. And she said, <coughs> or the Zhuzhiren said, <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse <coughs> Now that sounds like an ordinary sentence. You don't notice anything special. But how would you say it in English? Okay. So before you were 30, like your life before you were 30, there was one third of it that you spent in Taiwan. And two thirds of it you spent in Japan. You got the point now, right? So what can we match that up with in Chinese to show that Chinese and English do very different things in this situation? With intensification, then you do it. be distressed. repeated information, you don't distress. That's different, and that's important thing, an important thing to know. So in English, we do it when there is new information, when there's contrasted information. If we repeat old information, we don't stress it. Right? I lost a hat. What kind of hat? We don't say what kind of hat. With intensification, we also do it. It was really great. It was really great. It was great. No, it was really great. And you do that in Chinese too, with intensification. But if you are simply repeating old information, you do not distress it in Chinese. With that example, how about if you say it as native speakers? Do you remember my sentence? How about if one of you volunteers? Just say it in Mandarin. So I'm not, I'm not a native speaker, so I'm not valid. I mean, I'm, I think it's okay, but <laughs> I'd rather have a native do it. Who would like to do it? All right, louder, please. Right. There's no difference in stress, is there? And I've heard this a number of times on the radio. I mean, even when I was listening to ICRT, I would hear it in a Chinese commercial or something like that. It sounded strange to my ears in Chinese. Although I know it's correct, there's a part of me that is always saying, you don't stress something you've already mentioned. So that part of me is Gunsen Digu. It's very deeply internalized in me. So when I hear that, to my ears, but it doesn't sound that way at all to your ears, does it? 
Because I heard another example which I have forgotten. It's probably somewhere in my notes on my computer somewhere. Um, and I asked a bunch of Chinese, I said, do you notice anything funny about this? They said, no, it's perfectly correct. So that's a place where I will probably say it correct in Chinese, but when I'm listening to it, it still sounds odd because it, you're stressing already known information too much. Yeah? I, I think because uh, is Yeah. Sounds, sounds, uh, sounds like, uh, yeah. And guo sounds more emphatic because it's a fourth tone. Actually, I think in the other example, it wasn't just a fourth tone, and you stress it just as much. You simply have a, you have a different rule in Chinese. You simply have a different rule in Chinese. And that was a really good example to point out the difference, the contrast. I have an American friend who is now doing research on that, on the difference between intensification and repeated information in the intonation of Mandarin and English. That's a really great topic. And um, she's working on that now. But isn't that an interesting contrast? That you do it in this situation, but you don't do it in that situation. You do it in both situations in English. That goes in your notes, because I don't, I mean, someone's now writing something about it, but it's not widely known. OK, just wanted to share that. Let's go back to laterals now. Laterals. Laterals is fine, except it sounds a little British or a bit formal. Laterals. I make a tap. Yeah, laterals. Mm -hmm. In chapter one. In chapter one. Hmm. In chapter one. Right. We re we regarded the term lateral as if it specified a manner of articulation. A manner of um, articulation. A manner of articulation. 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 <coughs> In a way comparable to I say comparable. One of the Ivy people says comparable, but I say comparable. Go ahead. Com comparable to other terms such other, as other. Your R. Other. Other. Right. Terms such as frictive, or stop, or approximate. Very good. I put more R's in there, and I think you should do a little more R, like lateral. I, I don't hear as much R. Regarded. That Regard, regarded. Yeah, more R. Regarded. Regarded. Good. Lateral. 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 Uh huh. Okay. But this is really. Mm -mm. Stop at stops. But this. But this is really an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. The central lateral opposition can be. Op opposition. Opposition. Right can be applied to all these, these manners of articulation, producing a lateral stop and a lateral frictive, as well as a lateral approximant, which is by far the most common form of lateral sound. The most common. Right, with an N. You missed the N the first time. You said common form. Can you hear the difference? Common form. OK, let's just figure out what she's saying before we get too far into the paragraph. We talked about laterals as though it was, it says as though, that means it isn't really. It specified a manner of articulation, which is something like fricative, stop, or approximate. But that makes it too simple. Laterals are kind of special. Um, the central lateral opposition can be applied to all these manners of articulation. So if lateral is a manner of articulation, like fricative, or stop, or approximate, it should contrast with them. So if it's an approximate, well, actually, no, we called it a lateral approximate. But we didn't talk about a lateral stop or a lateral fricative. We only talked about a lateral approximate, right? So we made it sound like lateral was a separate manner of articulation. But he says it's more complicated than that. Um, because we can also produce a lateral stop and a lateral fricative, as well as a lateral approximate, which is what we've been working with so far. Okay, but lateral approximants are the most common. So lateral approximants are the most common, but it is possible to also produce lateral fricatives and stops. Let's go on. The only, only English lateral phone, phoneme is phone, <coughs> phoneme. Phoneme mm -hmm. is L with Wu. L. Wu. Wu. Right. <coughs> with at least. Mm -mm. Stop. It stops. At least. Right. Everybody. At least. 
No, not list. List is 清单 This is so common in Taiwan English. This 已经变成台式英语的一个固定的一个 vocabulary item. At least, not a list. At least. At least. At least. At least. Good. Yes. At least、mm -hmm. in in British English. In British English, contrast it. He says, "I don't know about American, but at least in British English, we're sure about this." So, at least. At least.、Mm -hmm. At least、mm -hmm. in British English, right? Elephants,、uh, as in lead, as and, in not in, as in, as in, right? Lead and wool, wool, wool,、uh -huh. wool, as in bell,、mm -hmm. and bell, in bell. Good. In most forms of Ameri American English, initial、uh, has more vulgarization. Then it's typically heard in British English initial O. All right, and I've mentioned this in class before. In British English, clear L and dark L are usually more clearly distinguished. So lead, lead, lead. They won't say lead, which I might say. So lead, lead in British, and bell, bell. So clear L, dark L are clearly distinguished in British English. However, as I told you before, what's happening to dark L in British English? It's disappearing completely. It's just simply disappearing. They don't say building anymore. They say building. It's turning into an oo, or just simply disappearing. Bill, Bill Tyson. You can hear it on ICRT in the morning, because they have a British Ellie Mears. She reports and she says, and now the news with Bill Tyson. Bill, Bill instead of Bill. Okay. So, the post. Post-vocalic L is simply disappearing from British English. It's it's just disappearing. It's been doing it for a long time in the dialects, but it's getting more and more common. So it's a lot like Taiwan English in that way.、Um, that's the first thing.、Mm, the second thing is it says that in American English, clear L and dark L are often not as clearly distinguished, and this is true because I don't distinguish them that clearly. I think I do when I try, but if I don't try, my So-called clear L before a vowel will often be quite dark. So listen, l l I've got vulgarization. Listen, I can say listen, but it sounds very artificial and sort of British to me. Listen, listen. <laughs> it sounds like I'm trying to be very pedantic, although I am a teacher, so I suppose I'm pedantic anyway. But、um, it sounds like I'm being too formal. And too careful about my pronunciation, like you know, ma. Okay, it sounds sort of like that to my ears. So listen, I can say that, but I often say listen, listen. Can you hear the l?、Uh? I have dark l's all over the place. My l after vowels is even darker. Bill, not 就很明显了 My tongue may not be touching in front. No alveolar contact. Bill, bill, right. But listen, there's alveolar contact plus, plus. Can you hear? Plus, plus. 没有，你们听到？我这样是随口讲的 ，so I my L's are quite dark. No, I'm not really embarrassed about it because it's pretty representative. Americans just do that. Lots of us do. So in American English, you find vulgarization all over the place. It's most clear. It's clearest after a vowel, but before a vowel, it's very common. Okay? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, and also because in Taiwan English, there's often no L there, like pipo penso, right? So, building has an L. Building, bu, bu. It's an u. Building, building. Yep, bu. It's J U. It's palatalized there. So, building, building, building. Bu tison. Okay, I just heard that this morning. All right. So, any other questions? And you can hear how dark my L's are. If you just hear me say L, my big difference is I do have alveolar contact for a pre-vocalic L. So listen, my tongue will touch. Bill, my tongue doesn't touch in front. But I still have vulgarization for, for example, listen, listen, plus, plus, plus. And I hear it getting deeper and deeper as I mentioned in class before. The L in American English. Tends to be going deeper and deeper. It's getting uvular for, in some cases. Yeah, and for example, another person on ICRT is Ron Stewart. 
Ron Stewart, he has a really deep L. He has a uvular L. Ooh. I forgot what word it was. Okay, so in American English, it's getting quite dark. In British English, they still distinguish the two. Pre-vocalic L is clear, but post-vocalic L is simply disappearing. Okay. In, in all forms of English, English, the air flows freely without freely. audible. Freely. Free, freely. Mm -hmm. Right. Without audible friction, making the sound a voiced alveolar lateral approximant. Okay, voiced alveolar lateral approximant. Did everybody absorb that? 有声的, 是带音的, 边音, and it's an approximant, 接近音. Go on. It may be compared with the sound R in R, red, R, 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 in mm -hmm. red mm -hmm. which is for ma many people a voiced alveolar central approximant. A voiced alveolar central approximant. R, R. Tongue tip is close to your alveolar ridge, not touching, no friction, and the air is going over the top of the tip of the tongue, not from the side. So, R, R. Okay. Laterals are usually presumed to presumed? be presumed right. to be voiced approximants. Voiced. Voiced. Yep. Voiced approximants unless a specific unless un unless Good. a specific statement to the contrary is made. Okay, that's a Mangudina Pian. Unless a specific statement to the contrary is made. So Okay, um, does have to be voiced. what else do I want to say? Okay, so L in English is normally voiced. However, we know that allophonically, what happens with L? That's right, for example, play, play. And actually that brought me back to the question before I forget it. Remember I told you that there was a really technical question about the difference between an allophone and a phone? I didn't finish that. Um, why don't we talk about that? Can you give an answer to that? So we've got these people who are now in graduate school and they're either studying translation or linguistics or something. They're asking really good questions here and that was a really good question. I think that person came to the pronunciation workshop yesterday and he introduced himself. Okay, so can you answer that question? What's the difference between an allophone and a phone? What's the difference? Well, you're sort of getting in the right vocabulary, but not quite. Allophone, what's the Chinese? Tong wei in. That means an allophone always relates to a. You're not done. No. Uh, there. Phoneme. Remember, a phoneme is an abstract unit of sound. It's, it's not really any particular sound. For example, T in English is a phoneme. But there are many allophones of T. For example, T or uh, or tap or T or all kinds of things. Those are all allophones. I don't know if we have T. We might. Okay. But anyway, we have T. It's aspirated, unreleased stop at the end. We have an un, uh, a voiceless, uh, or an un, unaspirated voiceless T, for example, in stop. And we have the tap, like in better. So we've got all of those allophones. They all belong to this abstract idea of T, right? So T is the phoneme, and the allophones are all 实际上的呈现就是这些不同的 allophone, right? What are you laughing at? That's right. It's the butong the zi the ten xian, right? The the you that you present yourself to different people, that's an allophone of you. But you are the you inside. It's hard to know what you are because you're so many things. 
But when you're, be, when you're interacting with a certain person, you behave in a certain way. Then that's your sort of your allophone of yourself. Or I also said it's like, it's like a xing. For example, ni xing liu. Is there a person liu? No. Liu is just, it's sort of a marker for our family. My father's family name is Liu, mine is Liu, my mother's has a different family name, etc. But Liu marks this family, right? There is no one person called Liu. You have to have a name and it has to be a certain person with a, with a name, right? So that's another analogy for phoneme. It's like a xing. It shows a jiazu. And a phoneme is sort of like a symbol of a jiazu, right? Allophone is one of the realizations of that abstract notion. But what is a phone? How do we translate that into Chinese? An allophone is often translated with the same, with the same, with the same term, but it shouldn't be. And for years, I called allophone by this term. In zhi, 听过没有？价值的值，就是那个音，实际上的那个价值就是音值。So very often, when we're talking about allophones, we call it 音值 but really, it should be 同位音。Now, what is the difference? You can figure it out through Chinese between tong wei yin and yin zhi. Vivian has an idea. I haven't got it. Okay, you look like something hit you. Yeah, anybody? Can you explain the difference? It's a notional difference. It may not actually be a different sound, but it's guan nian sound yun bu tong. When we say allophone, then we are relating it to a phoneme. We know that the tap and the aspirated t, etc., we know that those all belong to t. For one thing, the English spelling system tells us, right? But sometimes we hear a sound, and we don't know what phoneme it belongs to. We have no idea. Either because it's too strange, or because, it's in a, um, because we haven't analyzed the language well enough yet. For whatever reason, we hear a certain sound. We don't know if it belongs to this phoneme or that phoneme. We're not going to do a phonological analysis. Just suan la. I'm just going to say this is how the sound is pronounced. That's all. It's a phone. Just na ma iga in. So any kind of sound of language can be called a phone. That means that we are not relating it to a phoneme. Yeah, we're not doing that analysis. Why are we not? Bu gao xin, bu xiang. If we don't feel like it, we don't have to, right? If we're just doing phonetics, we can say this phone and that phone. That means 实际上听到的音 If we are not doing a phonological analysis, we may not want to relate it to the phoneme, or maybe we don't know, or maybe we don't care. Whatever the reason is, that was the answer I basically gave. You can go look it up on on Facebook. Okay, everybody got that? So phoneme, that's a very abstract idea, a family or of yourself. Allophone is. We know it's属于这个家族的不同的成员，不同的呈现。But a phone is any actual sound of language. It's not a phoneme. It's an actual sound. But we're not relating it to any particular phoneme. Okay? That was worth mentioning. I think that's something you should know. Your students might ask you that someday. You think we never talked about that? So it's all my teacher's fault. All right, let's go in. <clears throat> go on in the book.、Mm. So. He's just establishing the background that we have laterals in English in both American and British. They are normally voiced approximants. We do distinguish between clear L and dark L, except I gave you some some clarifications on that. And、um, now we're going to find out some different kinds of Ls. We're going to learn about some different kinds of Ls. Next. <coughs> Try subtracting.、Mm, not tra- subtracting. Subtracting. Subtracting、right. the. And adding voice while saying an English a、uh, as in let as in as in yeah as in let、mm-hmm. you will probably find that the voiceless lateral you produce is a fricative, not an approximant. All right, so let make a voiced L first. Now make it voiceless. Do we hear friction? Yes, we do, but remember that is part of the definition of an approximant. Do you hear friction in the voiced version? Ooh, do we hear friction? No, but do we hear it in the voiceless version? 
That's the definition of an approximant. If you didn't know it before, please put it in your notes. I did mention it before. So approximants have no audible friction when they are voiced, but when they are voiceless, you will hear friction. Approximate Jules is a Beyonce. That's just the way approximants are. Because they're close, the two articulators are close, but not as close as fricatives. So we hear friction if we're not voicing them. Okay, let's go on. When the vocal vocals. Not when the. When the. When the. Good. When the vocal votes are apart. When the vocal what? The vocal votes. Folds. Folds, not V. Folds. Vocal folds. The vocal vocal folds That's are good. apart. The airstream flows more rapidly, so rapidly. that rapidly, rapidly, mm -hmm. so that it produces a fricative. It's so that it what? So that it produces hmm? pro produces. That's a sibilant, right? <laughs> so that it produces a fricative noise. Noise. A fricative mm -hmm. noise. A fricative noise. Mm -hmm. In passing between the tongue and the side of the the side teeth, mm -hmm. the symbol for Sim the everybody saying symbol. symbol. No, not everybody. Symbol. Some of you are symbol. 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 Good. It's short. The symbol for the sound <laughs> is the symbol for this sound. The symbol for this sound is all right. L, and you come back and make a loop. This is our new symbol, and this is. And this is used in, I think, the Hoisan dialect of Cantonese. 就是广东话有个台山的方言,它就是用这个音. Yeah, okay. Flam, flam san, 一二三的三好像是flam之类的. Flam, 对. S会变 t. Yeah, as I remember, this may be wrong, check it online. Because至少那个initial应该没有错. Right? So, in alternating the voice and voiceless sounds, you will be saying... All right, let's try this together, voiced and voiceless alternating, everybody. Wait, we've got it, no problem. It is possible... Not it, it. It is. Yeah. It is possible to make a non-fricative voiceless lateral, Good. but you will find that to do this... You to will, do this? To do this... Good. You will have to move the side of the tongue farther away from the teeth. The alternation. All, be, not all, all. The alternation. Alter. Alternation. The alternation. The alternation between a voiced and a voiceless lateral approximant. Approximant. Approximant okay. may be symbolized. All right. Now, what's the difference between between the voiceless lateral? And then, um, let's see, how are they saying? The voiced and voiceless sounds you're going to say, if you want to make a non-fricative voiceless lateral, you're going to have to pull your tongue further away from your palate. And so, what are we going to get? Let's try to make a non-fricative voiceless approximate, lateral approximate. So, if we have friction, it's... And you get close it gets kind of sloppy. But without friction, it's, we just hear breath, like an H, and it's lateral, okay? So those are two different, two different sounds. Actually, the voiceless fricative lateral follows naturally from the approximant. But the one with the circle, you have to make a special movement to create that, to make that right. So let's try the voiced, the fricative version, and then the non-fricative version of the voiceless. Go. There we go. Next. It is also possible to make a voice lateral that is a, a voice lateral that is a voice lateral that is a fricative. Good. Try doing this mm. by try doing this. Try. Mm -mm. Try. 你这样做试试看。你试试看这样做 in English is try doing this. We often right. By starting from an ordinary, or ordinary. I don't say airy. It's ordinary. Ordinary. Okay. Oh, as in that. Lead. Lead. Uh huh. Okay, that's not a T. And watch your vowel. Everyone, lead. 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 All right. Watch. If you're having trouble and saying lad, then go lead. 
Lead. Pina? Lead. No, don't zoya shi. Ping the. Ping the. If you go like this, it's going to be sloppy and it won't work. Lead. Okay, then don't say lad. Lad is shanang hai. Lead. Okay? As in lead. Good, okay. And then moving the sides of your tongue slightly closer to your teeth. Closer. Closer mm -hmm. to your teeth. You may find it easier to produce this sound by starting from the... To produce this sound. To produce this sound. Mm -mm. This we all found Zhongyin. Produce this sound. Listen. To produce this sound. To produce this sound. Good. By starting from the voiceless... From L M? From mm -hmm. the voiceless well. alveolar lateral fricative described in the previous paragraph. Paragraph? Paragraph. Mm -hmm. And then adding voicing. And then adding voicing. And then adding voicing. Right. When you get to the end of a phrase, remember to go up for the tonic. But make, making sure... Watch, watch out for the T. Again. But? Yeah. Making sure that you keep the fricative component. Very good. Keep. Very good. All right. So I've been very picky, but you corrected very well. We can also make a voiced lateral that is a fricative. So start with an ordinary L, then move the sides of your tongue closer to your teeth, and then you should be able to do it. So you went sloppy. Okay. So now we've got a whole bunch of different kinds of L's. Let's go on. <coughs> to summarize, there are four lateral sounds under discussion. Voiced alveolar lateral alveolar mm -hmm. lateral approximant You don't need a vowel there, just ooh. Ooh. You're you're doing something different than I am. Ooh. Just put your tongue in the position for a T. T T. There we go. That's nice. Ooh. Voiced alveolar lateral fricative. Okay. Voiceless alveolar lateral approximate. Uh -huh. And voiceless alveolar lateral fricative. There we go. Okay. No language uses the difference between the last two sounds contrastively. Good. But some but languages, but some languages, but some remember, but some languages mm -hmm. make a phone phonemic mm -mm. phonemic mm -hmm. distinction between three of the four possibilities. Mm -hmm. Zulu, for example, has a three-way con contrast as shown in the first row of table 7.7. .7. As you can see in the second set of Zulu words in table 7.7, .7, after a nasal, the voiceless fricative may be an ejective. And the final Zulu, Zulu word in the table illustrates an initial voiceless velar lateral ejective affricate. 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 Uh -huh using the symbol L for a velar lateral. For a, a velar lateral. Velar, velar lateral. Mm -hmm. listen, to li listen to this sound on the CD, but don't worry if you can't produce it in your first year of phonetics. Voiceless lateral, <coughs> lateral fricati fricatives Voices, voiceless lateral fricatives can also be exemplified by Exem exemplified mm -hmm. by Welsh words such as plan, 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 and that's written with a double L. So if you see Welsh written with two L's, for example, like Llewellyn, Llewellyn, a double L will be Llewellyn. Or Lloyd, L L O Y D, it's a common male name. <coughs> That's Floyd, yeah, right. Church and Calhel <coughs> knife. 
And what? Kol, 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 Sorry, kol, 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 a normal lateral. Doesn't he have a nice voice? What a nice voice. Okay, let me play it a few times. And by the way, this, these these types of sounds are really common in South African languages. We had to learn them when we were singing in South Africa. Hla, hla. Okay, this one's the voiced one again. La la. La la. Oh wait, we can't have any noise or we're not going to hear it. Again? Go ahead. La la. La la. All right, and then here's another one. Hunger. Injala. Okay, listen three times. Injala. 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 Let's try it. Listen and repeat. Injala. 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 In la la. All right. Then the next one. This one is voiceless. It's a an unpleasant word. Sansa. Listen three times. Sansa. 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 Okay. Once more. Listen and repeat. Sansa. 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 The next one is more complicated because we've got, do you see an adjective there? It's not that bad. Listen a few times. So, intlantla. Intlantla. Not that bad. Lan. 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 In Tlantla. In Okay. Now we've got a velar. Number three is velar. And I don't know how to do these. And these are extremely rare. And I think you're going to read, if you haven't already, or you probably already have read, in sounds and in vowels and consonants, that Peter Latifoged originally said there is no such thing as a velar lateral. Do you remember that? He said, there's no such thing. And then some guy in the audience says, excuse me, I have one of those in my language. And uh, this is an example of a velar lateral. And I don't know how to do this. We'll just listen. Yeah, I think it's OK. It's manageable. It's not that weird. All right. So that's Zulu laterals. Let's keep going. The distinction between a central and a lateral articulation can be applied to other manners to other, of, remember? To other manners right. of articulation in addition to approximants and fricatives. Trails are always centrally articulated, but flaps can be made with either a central or a lateral articulation. All right, are we understanding? So right now we're talking about approximants and fricatives. We're talking about laterals. And the two kinds of laterals we're talking about are approximants and fricatives. Um, trills are always centrally articulated. Now that sounds like a test question to me. Okay, So trills are always centrally articulated. They're not going to be lateral. There's no lateral trill. But flaps can be made with either a central or a lateral articulation. Go. If uh, when making a tap or a retroflex flap. Very good. You allow the airstream. The. You allow the airstream to flow over the sides of the town. You will produce a sound that is in, 
intermediate in intermediate remember everybody please remember nouns adjectives at and at please remember okay intermediate in quality between those between sound, those sounds between those sounds between those sounds and this will be a voiced alveolar or retroflex lateral flap all right so if you let some air out when you're producing a tap or a flap then it will be a voiced alveolar or retroflex lateral flap so ara and ara those are central but if we hold it a little longer let air out the sides we get ara ala ala and ala 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 and ala ala okay and actually this goes back to what we we're talking about with minayu um, if we use minayu then we can get the lateral tap perfect right so tada tada that is a lateral tap and that's what goes here out of context i don't do it but with tada i think i can do it uh huh and ara ara hold your tongue a little bit longer and you get air out the side okay and <clears throat> the symbol for either of these possibilities is it's an upside down lowercase r with a very long stem so remember that symbol you needed for minayu. We can use that now for tara. Use that symbol for tara, right? A sound of this kind sometimes occurs in languages such as Japanese that do not distinguish between er and l. So you can remember it easily because it looks like an r combined with an l. Go on. <clears throat> but some African languages. But what? But some. Hmm? Some. Oh yes, yeah, some African languages. But some African languages, mm -hmm. for example, Chaga, spoken in East Africa, make a phonemic distinction among all three of these sounds. All three of these sounds. All three of these sounds. These. These. Uh -huh. And phonemic. Phonemic. Right. You read really very well. Watch out for your E's, though. Some they, times they go like phonemic and this. So phonemic and these. Let's hurry up. We need to finish. The central, the central lateral distinction can, in some senses, be said to, to apply to stops as well. English stops with lateral plosion as, li as in little, 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 mm -hmm. can, of course, of course, <laughs> be considered to be sequences of stop plus lateral. Stop plus lateral. Stop plus lateral. Good. But the Navajo sound, tl, uh. tl. Ejective, yeah. In which the, the ejective airstream, me airstream mechanism. Ejective airstream mechanism. Ejective airstream mechanism mm -hmm. applies to both the stop and the lateral is appropriately. A pro? Appropriately. Right. Called, called a lateral ejective. Similarly, we clearly want to distinguish between the central and lateral clicks. And uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds like we're having a very delicious snack. <laughs> uh huh. Um, similarly, we want to distinguish between the central and lateral clicks. So we have and right. Okay. So la la la. Okay. Let's go on. Fla. Uh, it's got, I think it's got um, aspiration because it's voiceless. Let's go on. Having, having seen that the central lateral distinction. Uh, having seen that the central lateral distinction. When you're reading this, make sure you pause because these are two separate things and they're missing and. It means central and lateral. And sheng lue le jiao ting. So, bi fang so. In Chinese, when you say 简单好学,中间可能有点pause,没有and,简单又好学,简单好学, this is the same thing. So central lateral distinction. Having seen that the central lateral dis distinction can apply to a number of different manners of articulation, we must now consider whether it consider consider mm -hmm. whether it applies to gestures with yes, yes. gestures Good. with different target places target different target places yeah 
different target places of of of,、mm -hmm. of articulation. Here, the limit limitations are obvious. Generally speaking, generally not generally. We need to leave out a schwa there. Generally speaking, generally speaking,、mm? long. Generally, generally. There we go. Generally speaking,、mm -hmm. laterals La are La laterals、mm -hmm. are made with the tip blade or front of the tongue. Good. They may be either dental, 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 right? As in Malay. Malayalam. Our class is so good at that word. I'm so impressed. <laughs> and toda, yeah. Alveolar, as in English, retroflex, also in Malayalam and other Indian languages, or palatal, or or palatal. Palatal. Palatal,、mm -hmm. as in Italian. Ital. Italian.、Mm -hmm. Velar laterals do occur. We noted. Noted a velar lateral. A velar lateral. A velar lateral、mm -hmm. in Zulu, but in that, but in that language. But in that language. In that language,、mm -hmm. it does not con. It does not contrast with. It does not contrast with other laterals in the same context. Good. So it's not distinctive. It occurs, but it's not distinctive. We have to stop, don't we? <laughs> okay. <sighs> That's all right. So test will be moved to next Monday, a week from today, Wednesday, as you predicted. Actually, I thought it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think actually it's better that way. It gives you more time because we've just learned these things; they're new. So I think it's better that you have a little more time to absorb them.、Um, let's mark where you stopped. Same context every day, and that's Annie. So you start next time. We'll finish up. Absolutely, finish up for sure. We will absolutely do the exercises next time for sure. And as for the rest, rest of the time, I may give you, I may give you、uh, either a dictation, or I'm thinking of giving you the pronunciation test that I use in my pronunciation workshop for Shida. It's got 25 items, and I use that to tsunduan people's pronunciation problems. And accompanying with that, I have an Excel spreadsheet. With a list of, if you got this wrong, what's your problem, and which should the article should you read, and then what do you have to work on? That's what I did. Okay, and I'm not even doing that to promote Shudu. It's because I think that's the best way to help people. So we might do that on Wednesday. You'll see how you compare to the, or Iban Minjong, who sign up for these workshops. So that will be Wednesday. So Wednesday we finish the chapter, finish the exercises. We may have this pronunciation test, and. If we have time, we might start Chapter Eight. We need to get going, and Chapter Eight is going to be very new. Like I said, it's going to be new for me to some extent because Professor Johnson changed quite a few things. He didn't change the other chapters very much, but he changed that one a lot. So we may get started on Chapter Eight if we have time, and that's it. We'll see you on Wednesday.